Ist wie so an. Okay. I have a sort of outline for you guys. Here. How should we divide this up? Can you help me, Kate? Yeah, that's okay, cool. You guys want to pass these out? This is just an overview. That's just an overview of the uh, book. What? Okay. I don't want to block the, the screen here. All right. I don't want to pray while the papers are being passed out. It's going to interrupt. Distract. It's going to distract. Okay. Oh, I do have. Okay. Before we get into the class, Sam, Hayden, and Ryan, were you guys able to clean in here last night? No. Okay. Uh, I already talked to Lauren, Faith, and Caitlin. No. Trash, Brett. I heard you've been on it. Brett's been on it. Okay. Uh, Lily, Trisha, Leslie, Emma, and Keely. Have you guys been checking on the cars? Yes. Not yet. How much gas is in them right now? I didn't check. Okay. Okay. Um, Maddie, have you been doing the bathroom? Maddie, Kate. Oh, she's not feeling well. Oh yeah. Uh, Seth, have you been doing the bathroom? No, I haven't. Better than normal. Okay. You didn't last night, though. Laundry room, Trent and Nick. No. So what? what why am I doing this right now? Because I have to. I feel like I have to warn you before we take you out to the service project. Okay. So next time, if you guys don't do it, yeah, it's written on your it's written on your uh, thing if you're supposed to do it. So we can go check. Maybe maybe we'll we'll have tomorrow be our our day where we we check in on all those. Okay, but tomorrow's the last day of February, or today's the last day of February. So all the duties are going to change tomorrow. Okay. Yes. If you're sick, you have to get someone to fill in your duty, correct? Well, if you're sick, it would be if you're sick, it would be great if you could find somebody to fill in for you. Okay? I know that's probably the last thing on your mind, but that would be it. That would be ideal. Um, if nothing else, if you're sick, tell me that you're sick and you're not gonna be able to do your duty. That way I can find somebody. But but it would be Let's just say you find somebody. What if you stick up our duty? Can we tell you? Then you're getting a new one tomorrow. Yeah. The Lord is usually better than me at helping with those things. Uh, okay. Lord, thank you for this book of Joshua. Lord, I just pray that you would uh, inspire us, give us faith, and Open up our hearts to understand what your word is saying. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so we're going to jump into Joshua chapter 1. This is kind of my quick uh, summary. I want to explain what is, over and over in the book of Joshua, God says, I will give you the land. And whenever I think of that word gift or give, I always think about Christmas and little Christmas presents under the tree. I don't know if you guys think about that. But we're not talking about Christmas presents under the tree. We're talking about, this is the analogy I came up with. So I'm going to read the first uh, scripture here. Joshua 1, 1 through 2. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. He's got to tell him the obvious. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. Get ready. Get ready, guys. Christmas is tomorrow. You're going to get a bunch of gifts. Does that ever happen? No. Your parents don't come to you on Christmas Eve and say... Christmas in July before, so that's awkward. Yeah, yeah, that's a little different. 
I'm talking about, I'm talking about, you're going to get a Christmas gift tomorrow. Get ready. Get ready, Caleb. You're going to get a gift. Here's, here's, what, here's how I'm thinking about it. So you're living your life. I kind of alluded to this a couple days ago in a, in a verse of the day. You're living your life, and um, I have this written down over here. Might as well look at my notes. Imagine your father runs a massive business, massive corporation. He's got thousands and thousands of employees, thousands of like dollars in the bank, all kinds of machinery, equipment, land that this business owns. And he says, uh, you know, over and over, he's been telling you, one day I'm going to give you the business. And then he comes to you one day and says, next week, I'm going to give you the business. Get ready. So what does that mean? That means maybe you've had a couple side hustles. Maybe you've had a couple other things you've been doing to make ends meet, uh, occupy your time. But this is like what you've been waiting for for a long time. And it means you're going to move aside all the other things in your life. This gift is not just like a w object, but it's going to change your identity. You're now the CEO, right? You have rule over all kinds of employees, resources, machinery. Your identity changes, okay? You're now the CEO. What else? It means... Uh, It means everything's about to change. The other, the other thing I wanted to say is that uh, later on, God uses the word inheritance to describe the, the, the gift that he's giving. This is in, in, an inheritance. It's not a, uh, a gift that you consume, use up on your own, and then there's nothing left. An inheritance is something, hopefully, that you use you steward, you take care of, and you pass on to your children. The better you are at stewarding your inheritance, the more that your children are going to have. Does that make sense? So, so this isn't a gift of like, I take the gift and I use it up. It's a gift of, I steward this massive thing, and however good I am at doing that, I'm going to be able to pass it on to others. The other thing in the, these scriptures that, I just want to point out is, it says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, he's the big dog that has been, has brought the children, the people, children of Israel out of Egypt. And the scary thing is, is when the man of God passes away, steps down, you know, what's going to happen? God is not attached to people, but to his mission. So, we have to be careful not to attach, um, you know, what God's doing to individuals. You know, I, th it, I can't you see a little bit of that in America today? There's like the culture of personality where this pastor is the man. He does some great things, but then after he passes on, the church that he pastors kind of disappears. You have to be careful not to put too much uh, belief or hope into people and what they're doing, but more in what the mission is that God's trying to do. Um, so I just want to show you guys a little map. This is where the Israelites are right now uh, before they're going to cross the Jordan River in the story. Um, so I wanted to sh tell this uh, story to you guys um, to kind of illustrate this. God is not attached to a person, but a mission. Um, so there's that scripture, you know, John, in John chapter three, where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he says, you must be born again. And he says, well, do I need to go back into my mother's womb? And he says, no, uh, you have to be born of the spirit. And then he says, the wind goes where it pleases. You don't know where it's going or, or what it's doing, but the wind goes where it pleases. For most of my childhood when I was growing up, I would get taken on these outreaches. So we would go door to door, knock on doors, 
and like pastors would say like, hey, you're going to uh, go share the gospel with these people. Or we'd go out into this shopping center at our house or near in our main city um, and then, you know, say, hey, get on the mic and preach the gospel. And as a young boy, I was super intimidated by this. And in the years afterwards when I wasn't doing that, I would feel super guilty whenever I wasn't involved in some sort of outreach. Super ashamed of myself. How Am I a real Christian if I'm not sharing the gospel? Uh, am I, does God really love me if I'm not out there knocking on doors? So I would say I could never do this stuff. Um, and I remember I was, uh, not long after I'd gotten saved, I was working on a house that my dad owned. It had been, like, demolished by these renters. And I'm listening to a sermon, and uh, there's a pastor telling a story about someone like me who comes to the pastor and says, like, I just feel terrible. I, I'm terrified every time I go share the gospel. I'm terrified. And the pastor's sitting there across from the guy, and he goes, well, um, you know, God still loves you. You don't have to right now. Maybe just know that God loves you. And so the boy leaves the, the office, and a couple days later, a week later, a couple weeks later, a couple people come up to the pastor and they say, like, hey, what did you tell this guy? All he's been doing is telling people about Jesus. He said, uh, he didn't, I just told him that he didn't have to, that God still loved him regardless. The, uh, what I'm trying to say is there's a sense in which the Holy Spirit will empower us to share the gospel. When the Holy Spirit gets you on fire, gets you awake, some of you guys are looking a little bit like you're falling asleep, but uh, when the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, he's going to direct you into the things that he wants. The wind blows where it pleases. Like you can't, you can't really necessarily tell, but there's going to be a desire inside of you to want to go out and do something. There's going to be something that you can't explain. There's going to be a, a fire inside of you to want to go and share the gospel. Um, yeah. This, um, I'll come back to that one. So here we go, Joshua 1, 3 through 4. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert in Lebanon to the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead this people to inherit the land I swore their ancestors to give them. One of the things that, that strikes me when I, when I read this um, text um, every place you will set your foot, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Uh, these two scriptures at the end of Jesus' life, he's talking about, this is the Great Commission, this is where Jesus is sending out his disciples. Look at the similarities between these, these scriptures. Um, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. I will give you every place you set your foot. You know, I will give you every place you set your foot. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm just bringing this up because doesn't it excite you guys when you see things in the Old Testament or in the Bible that show up over and over and over. Uh, things that repeat. The, showing that God, that Jesus is the same 
yesterday, today, and forever. What are some of the, uh, can some of you guys, can I get some volunteers to look up some of these scriptures? What's up? Go for it, Colby. What are you going to take? Good out. Romans 6.23. Can we get someone with John 3.34? Caitlin? Keely, what do you want to, where are you going to? Romans 15.5. Anyone else? Okay. Second Corinthians? I'll do second Corinthians. Okay. Sam, you take the next one. Mm -hmm. John 10.28. Well, maybe you do John 10, 28. We, we got John 3, 16 on lock. <laughs> What's that? 13, 34. Okay. And then John 14, 27, anybody? Trisha? Matthew 6, 33. Kate? Caleb, you want to take Psalm 2, 7 through 12? We might not get through all these, but what are some of the gifts God has promised us as Christians? Who's got John 1.12? Uh, but to all who did receive him, uh, but, all, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. What do you think, Colby? All right. Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. All right. Eternal life. How about uh, John 3.34? Sorry, so read the beginning one more time for me. He gives the spirit without measure. So he gives us the Holy Spirit without measure. Uh, let's do uh, Romans 15, 5. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in the form of Christ Jesus. Grant you endurance and what? Encouragement. Encouragement. Endurance and encouragement. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 7. For, for because of these surpassingly great revelations, therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. A messenger of Satan, a thorn in my flesh. John three sixteen. God gave his one and only son, that whoever may believe in him. Uh, John ten twenty eight. How about John 13.34? So he gives commands. Uh, John 14.27? Gives us peace. Uh, Matthew six thirty-three. Matthew six uh, thirty-three. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added. What are all these things? Do any of you guys know? Some translations say all these things will be given to you as well. What are, does anybody know what he's talking about there? Isn't it like the rest of your like areas, other areas of your life? Will, you don't have to seek after like um, wealth and family and relationships and stuff, but if you seek God first, then all the other areas of your life will fall in as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, I think he says specifically like what you will eat, what you will drink, what you will wear. Um, what you eat, what you drink, and what you wear will be added to you as well. 
Um, now this one, uh, Psalm 2, 7 through 12. Sorry, I think I gave you too much to read. I just wanted to do the ends of the earth, uh, your inheritance. So that's part of what I was uh, talking about this morning with the church and um, going into the ends of the earth. Uh, So this is an important one for me, one near and dear to my heart. Somebody want to read uh, Joshua 1, 7 through 9 for us? I can read it. Okay. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be afraid, do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Awesome. How is this different than what the world tells us will create success? Then you will be prosperous and successful. Well, yeah. But are you getting that? Are you getting that from meditate? Yeah. Um, what else? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I kind of get think before you act. Don't we live in a culture where a lot of people just act on their will and do what they want to do? The med- meditating on what's right and thinking about how we are to live. I think this verse is definitely speaking into that, how we are supposed to think deeper and make sure that we're um, not only meditating on it day and mm-hmm. night, but that we're being careful to act upon what is correct of us to act upon. Mm-hmm. How has this been a part of your life? At Anchor House. Yeah. Um, I mean, we do meditate on the Bible day and night, and um, I mean, we're just being poured into all the time, so mm-hmm. um, we are being strong and courageous with the walk of God. Hmm. Yeah. Have you, how have you seen being at the Anchor House, uh, the Book of the Law? being the Bible always on your lips, how have you seen that affect your life? I mean, that's a question a lot of you have answered in testimonies and stuff, but specifically, like, sort of in your day-to-day life, how does, how has this affected you? Yeah. Refuel, yeah, get energy, yeah. Um, So, one of the things I have you guys ever talked about neuro neuroplasticity in this room? Do you guys remember remember it at all? Okay. What was the relationship guy talked about? It? Yeah, that's what it was. Okay. Which one? Jim Burns. 
So I didn't want to I didn't want to go too deep into it if someone else had taught it, but we'll do a little refresher. So this lady, Dr. Caroline Leaf, she is a Christian uh, brain scientist. What? There's a neurologist. She's a neurologist. Okay. This was supposed to be a video, but I don't know why it's just a picture. But I can use the the picture. So basically what neuroplasticity is, for most of science, they believe that if you damage neurons in your brain, that they're damaged forever. Your brain is a fixed thing that can't be changed. Neuroplasticity teaches that your brain is changing. And the way it changes is if you stimulate, say this is a neuron, if you stimulate a neuron, it actually grows and gets more connected to the rest and other parts of your brain. So, for example, say uh, you have been thinking a negative thought about yourself. I am uh, not good enough. I can't do it, right? You've been thinking that over and over and over. You open up your Bible in the morning, and the morning is important too because while you sleep, your brain creates new neurons, okay? Every time when you sleep, your brain creates new neurons. So this new neuron is created while you sleep. You wake up in the morning, you open your Bible, and you read the scripture, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, the thoughts that God has for me are greater than the sand on the seashore. Or God says, I am married to the backslider, the one who keeps slipping and falling. I'm going to keep coming back and bringing that person back. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Those neurons start getting stimulated. You come back the next morning and you read another scripture that affirms the same idea. So this other neuron over here that was saying, I'm not good enough, I can't do it. That neuron, the physical neuron in your brain starts to die and starts to disappear. This other one starts to grow. So your, your brain, your actual physical neurons, your thoughts are physical things inside your brain. You can kill certain thoughts. The, the physical, you know, neuron that is making you think that, you can kill it by ignoring it. And you can bring other ones to life by meditating on it. Kill it permanently or just until you think about it again? That's a good question. But they, they call it uh, neurogenesis. So like when you stimulate a thought, it grows. And they call it neuro pr neural pruning when you, uh, when the thought is dying. Here's a, here's a neuroscientist talking about it. See if I can, uh, it didn't really go, work like the last one. Okay, I'm just going to show you guys a short bit of this. Uh, how come there's no sound? It was a phenomenon was known as neurogenesis. And what neurogenesis means is the creation of new neurons when there was none before. This idea is fascinating. The simple shifting between one cell to, become, to have more neurons and have more neurogenesis on one side is known as neurogenesis, which is what we describe now. But on the reverse process, something called synaptic pruning, which means if you don't use this nerve cell or you don't use this particular circuit, you will start losing connections. And I think most of you here agree. By show of hands, who has become really good at something through simply by training every day at it? And then by show of hands, who has lost a talent, lost a skill, by not training for a period of time. Simple, right? Neuroscience is much simpler than people. Okay. I don't want to go too deep into that video. But you guys get the idea, yeah? Uh, what your thoughts, the thoughts that you think about 
grow. And the thoughts that you reject just will die in your brain. Have you ever guys heard that scripture? Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, Psalm chapter 1, nor sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. He will be like a tree planted by the streams of water, yielding fruit in season. His leaf, his leaf does not wither, and whatever he does prospers. Okay, Psalm chapter 1. That's what your thoughts look like. They kind of look like trees, don't they? <laughs> this is one of the things you can look, if you guys want to go do a deep dive in the Bible, is look up what trees symbolize in the Bible. A lot of times you'll see trees show up. There's a one scripture that prophesies about Jesus. It says all the trees will clap their hands. I think what it's talking about is all the, like, people who are righteous, who are like the tree planted by streams of water, all the righteous will rejoice. When Jesus shows up, the righteous rejoice because they're like, this is the guy. This is the guy. So, one of the, uh, one of the struggles I had growing up in a Christian environment is in our church every now and then there would be pastors that would come and they would be teaching on uh, going into all the world and preaching the gospel and as a young boy they would do these sort of like altar calls where they're like if you're willing to give your life to share the gospel raise your hand and so I would raise my hand sometimes feeling very like drawn in the moment and uh, there was always this thought in the back of my head though am I doing this to look like a spiritual person or is this really what I'm supposed to do like how do I know if this is really what God is calling me to do or is this me just responding to peer pressure and this is one of the things that I think will help you develop into becoming somebody who doesn't just do the right thing in order to fit in with the crowd, be a part of a group that maybe all the group that you're in, they're all going the way of Christ. And so then when you're in that group, you're going the way of Christ. And when you're in a group that is against, it's, you find yourself slipping back into that group's way of thinking. Jesus said, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. What Jesus is saying is, choose to do these spiritual disciplines. Choose to do these things when nobody's looking. Choose to do them when uh, there's nobody else influencing you around. This this is the way that you'll find, if you find your identity in Christ, you find your reward from God in those moments of prayer, reading scripture, seeking God, then it's going to help you be a leader. This is, this is God's instructions to Joshua. This is how you're going to be able to lead the people and be successful, is if you meditate on my word day and night, it's going to make you careful to do it. So, there's three things that, that God commands Joshua. He says, do not let it depart from your mouth. So, speak the word of God. Meditate on it day and night. And do it. We all know that the scripture that says, don't be hearers only, but be doers of the word. Um, can you guys all... Right now, do you guys all have something to write with? Yeah? I just want you to take a, a second, and I want you to try to think of a scripture. Pick a scripture that you want to meditate on.
Okay. Homework assignment is to do something that's going to cause you to meditate on that scripture and put it into practice. So maybe prepare a devotional, write a song. Maybe the scripture is to do some sort of act of love. If you guys, uh, this is kind of the, uh, the challenge or takeaway from this, this text. I want to um, skip ahead since we only have a few more minutes of, um, of class. I want to show you guys a video about a leader that I got to kind of study and follow. And the reason why I want to show this video is uh, the principles of leadership that this, he's a motorcycle racing team manager. The principles in the book of Joshua, I think, apply to this guy in terms of the world of dirt bike racing, okay? So this isn't the world of Bible and scripture. This is the world of dirt bike racing. And in dirt bike racing, the most important thing is fitness. If you're fit and strong, you're able to last and endure. So, um, yeah. I'm just, When you fly with Southwest, we give you our ball. Low fares, no change. Oh, uh, no. The thing that's different about a Google vacation home, you always have the whole place to yourself. Oh, jeez. I'm just going to read you the first paragraph. 